All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Today is Thursday, June 17th, 2021. A couple quick notes before uh, we get started today. Uh, I uh, un unexpectedly am being uh, pulled away from home uh, today after class, so I will not have the opportunity to have office hours. I will have email access, so if you have any questions, uh, please ask them that way, but I won't be in my office hours to answer any questions for those of you who are planning on stopping by, so please send me emails. Also, along the lines of contacting me, it has come to my attention that a couple people have tried to leave phone messages for me. I do have an office phone, and in the past, our office phone numbers have been forwarding the voice messages to our email. So I have been getting that. For some reason, I am not getting that. I have not been on campus. I don't have access to my office right now. Um, I have put a call into tech support to see why this is the case. But uh, what I would say is that for the time being, even though there is an office phone, I am supposed to get those messages. I am not getting them right now. So as always, email is going to be the best way to get a hold of me. So if you have any questions or concerns or anything, uh, please send me those via email. Don't call my office and leave a message there because I'm not getting them right now. All right. Those are the administrative stuff. Let's get that. That is out of the way. Let's get to the important stuff. Uh, the important stuff is that as the schedule starts to get shorter, that means it's starting to get scarier because we are closer and closer to the exam. Two more lectures today and tomorrow. Uh, today, we are going to finish up our tissues. We've talked about epithelial tissues and connective tissues. Now we're going to put them together to make some membranes. And then finally, I say finally, although we've been in the class for like a week and a half, we are going to have worked our way up to the level of an organ system. And we're going to get a chance to finally talk about our first organ system and begin our introduction to uh, the integumentary system, the skin. I uh, won't have a lot of lab stuff to do today, but I will be able to answer any histology questions or anything like that that you guys have. I think we've stayed pretty up on that, although I do have some membrane stuff I want to do today as we go through that. Uh, there are a couple more assignments that you're going to be doing. Unit 6 review is due uh, tomorrow, as is your epithelium connective tissue handouts. Again, make sure you're doing those drawings. You're not getting graded on your drawings just for completing them and for labeling them properly. Again, this is a study guide that is going to help you to be successful on the tissue portion of the exam, which is always the part that is the most challenging because it's the least intuitive. It's the stuff that, you know, most people haven't done a lot of microscope work and aren't used to looking at slides. So it is some of the more challenging stuff. So the more time and effort you put into that, the more successful you will be on the exam. You do have a fingerprint homework assignment that you're going to be doing. It is based on the activity in your lab manual. Your lab manual has this fun activity where you have to fingerprint everybody and figure out who the bad guy is or something along those lines. And obviously, we're not going to be able to do that. But what your text, what your lab manual does have is a really nice chart that shows many of the minutia of details, as well as the major details like the, the loops and the swirls and things along those lines. And so I encourage you to, uh, to uh, take a fingerprint of yourself, one or two, take a fingerprint of your loved ones, take a fingerprint of some stranger walking down the street. I don't care whose fingerprint it is, uh, but take a fingerprint and start looking for some of these details because these are details using that chart on page 146 that you would be responsible for identifying on a lab exam. All righty, and that leads us to Monday. You have the weekend to study, and then Monday you have your lab and lecture exam. Again, exams must be completed during class time. You can complete them in any order that you want. If you're more comfortable with the essay questions, then you can start with the lecture exam. If you like the pictures, then you can go with the lab exam first. Again, from previous experience of this online environment, more people have problems uh, with the loading of the images for the lab exam. Uh, than they do for the lecture exam. So I would strongly encourage you to start with the lab exam so that if you have any problems, uh, if you have weak internet access where you're at, make sure you have your computer or move your computer to a place where you've got strong internet uh, so that you can download those images so, uh, effectively. Again, remember, if you have problems, the first place you should go to is to the tech support of Proctorio. They can actually access the exam and help you with things that way, things that I don't have access to. Uh, if you get kicked out and can't get back in or something along those lines, that's when you want to reach out to me. But most of the time, they're better able to help you resolve most of the issues. They've got more control over the, the program than I do. Uh, so it's okay to let me know that you're having problems. 
but the Proctorio tech support is the best people to reach out to. Uh, they've got a chat window that pops up. They're very useful and most of the time are able to help people. And uh, again, be aware that if you do get kicked out, you are able to get back into the exam, but the timer does keep running. So once you start an exam, if you have two hours to complete that exam, you do have two hours. So don't sit for an hour waiting for things to resolve before you jump back in, because that's going to cut down on your time significantly. Again, then we hit the ground back running right after the exam on Tuesday, we dive into the skeletal system and then also on Tuesday, we will start uh, uh, forming our groups, not starting, we will form our groups, get assigned your bones and bone uh, features that we will start presenting on uh, Thursday when we come back after the break from that. So, uh, like I said, the pace continues. Welcome to summer school. All right, questions on any of that? I had a question about yes. the lecture exam. Yes. Is that is that 100 points as well? No. Uh, well, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the so then uh, my my no is to the as well. All of the lecture exams are going to be worth 100 points in this class. Uh, they are a combination of multiple choice questions, fill in the blank questions, and essay questions. And all of them are worth 100 points. The lab exams are not worth 100 points. The lab exams vary because each section has a different amount of anatomy associated with it. So some tests may be as small as 60 points. Other tests may be as large as 85 points. So the lab exams are going to vary in how much they are worth. Uh, but all of them, like I said, I think the largest one is going to be somewhere around 85. So all of them are worth less than the lecture exams, uh, whereas the lecture exams are all going to be worth 100 points. All right. Any other questions? Great one. Any others? All right, perfect. Then let's dive into our lecture. Last class, we had gotten through our epithelial tissues and our connective tissues. And so now we are going to put epithelial tissues and connective tissues together to make membranes. And that is essentially what a membrane is. A membrane is a superficial after all, we know epithelial tissues line surfaces, a superficial epithelial tissue, and some type of connective tissue that lies underneath it. The entire surfaces, plural, of your body, both inside and out, are covered with one of four main types of membranes. We have identified at least two of these already in the class, but let's see if we could do all four. Can someone give an example of one of our four membrane types we find in the body? Cirrus. I'm sorry, say again? Cirrus. Serious, excellent. That was the first one we learned about. So again, serious membranes. Again, fun with vocabulary. Serious is the adjective that describes the membrane. If we wanted to turn that around and make that a noun, we would say serosa. Excellent. What's another one? Oh, there you go. Samuel's got it. A mucus membrane. Again, mucus is the adjective that describes the noun membrane. If we wanted to just use it as a noun, we would say mucosa. What else? Cutaneous. Cutaneous. Cutaneous membrane. And if we wanted to say cutaneous membrane as a noun, how would we say that? Cutana. True, that, that would be a good guess, and that would be a mean thing for our anatomists to do, but there's an even easier way to call a cutaneous membrane as a noun. Skin. There you go. Your cutaneous membrane is your skin or integument. That would be a fine way of doing it as well. So both of those would be the noun, uh, which of course is the major organ of our integumentary system. There you go. 
Any idea what the fourth is? The, those, I think, are the three easy ones that we can pick off. Anybody either uh, cheat by looking ahead at the lecture notes or actually read it and know? Oh, there it is. Arabella's got it. Synovial membranes. Where do you find those? The other three I'm pretty comfortable with. Where do you find synovial membranes? Anybody know? Anyone know where you might find your synovial membranes? Joints, there you go. Excellent, in our joints. Spectacular. So there you go. Those are our four main types of membranes. And here's a pretty picture that shows those locations. Again, some examples of where you would find them, a mucous membrane, a serous membrane, a cutaneous membrane, and a synovial membrane. Now, one of the important things to remember about membranes is that, again, they are made up of an epithelial tissue on top and a, a cutaneous, uh, pardon me, a connective tissue underneath. So let's start first by talking about a mucous membrane. And I'm going to bounce back and forth between our whiteboard and our lecture to do this because it's gonna, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of writing. So I wanna make sure uh, that we've got all of this information. So let's start and I worry about it being too big. So let's go here. So we have lots of room to write. We will first talk about a mucous membrane. Excellent. Now, there's a couple things that we need to know about all of our membranes. We need to know their locations, where you would find them, and we also want to know the function of them as well. So let's start easy. What is the function of a mucous membrane? Lubricate. Okay, some of it can be to lubricate. Lubricate and like catch dust. Right, so, so for lubrication, protection, catch, catching dust, and those kind of things. And how does it lubricate? How does it protect? With mucin, the yeah. protein mucin exactly. mixed with water. It produces mucus. All right, it produces mucus. And as you pointed out, really what it does is it produces the protein mucin. Uh, which we know hydrates to become mucus. And then it provides that lubrication, provides that protection, provides all of that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. That is the function. So then the question becomes, how would you define the location of a mucous membrane? Um, I mean, the location would be kind of where something can not enter the body, but you know, I, orifice. I, I, exposed? I think absolutely. Between the two of you, I think you've hit it right on the head. Mucous membranes, and again, I'll, I'll try to uh, write it a little bit more eloquently, but I think you guys said it perfectly. Basically, it lines cavities uh, that are open to the outside world, right? This is how they're providing that protection. This is how uh, they're producing that mucus. They're basically all of those wet openings to the outside world. And remind me again, which organ systems then this would be associated with? Respiratory. Respiratory, excellent. Digestive. 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 Reproductive and Reproductive. urinary. Reproductive and urinary. There you go. Those four organ systems are all open to the outside world, and all of them are lined with mucous membranes. All right. Excellent. Now, for each of these membranes, we need to know what epithelial tissue is going to form them and what connective tissue is going to form them. So let's think about this. Epithelial tissues. Um, we just identified the four organ systems that are lined with mucous membranes. So pick one. Someone pick one of those four organ systems. 
Digestive. Digestive, excellent. What epithelial tissue lines the digestive system? Simple columnar. Excellent. Simple columnar by far uh, lines the majority of our digestive system. However, does it truly line all of our digestive system? No. no, not at the beginning and not at the end. What's at the beginning and what's at the end? The pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Well, or okay, no. so you are correct. Ciliated, uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissues line our nasal cavity, line our trachea, but those aren't part of the digestive system. So you are correct for the respiratory system, that will be one of them. But what about the front and the back of the digestive system? What lines the oral cavity, the proximal part of the esophagus and the anus? Stratified squamous epithelial. And you get partial credit for that on the exam because what non are- Non-character, non-keratinized. Perfect. Non-keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial tissue. Excellent. Uh, ciliated pseudostratified columnar lines our nasal cavity, but is that what we find in our lungs? No. When gas exchange takes place, what needs to be there? Simple squamous epithelial. And I'll tell you a secret, our, our respiratory system doesn't go instantly from ciliated sort of stratified to simple squamous. It actually also has some simple columnar in there as well. It has some simple cuboidal in there as well. And that brings us to our reproductive system which as we talked about, uh, the vaginal canal is lined by the nine keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. However, that's the female. The male reproductive system happens to be the same as the urinary system. So what is the urinary system in males and the urinary system in females? What are they lined with? Transitional. Epithelial. Transitional. Notice for our epithelial tissues, for our mucous membrane, it can be almost any of the epithelial tissues we've talked about. What epithelial tissue helps to form a mucous membrane is totally dependent on where that organ is located and what its function is. If it's directly connected to the outside world, like the oral cavity, we want lots of layers of cells protection. If it's gas exchange, we want the thinnest layer. If it's in the nose, we want to be able to move the mucus. Right? Urinary system needs to be able to expand. All those different epithelial tissues. So pretty much any epithelial tissue can be part of a mucous membrane. However, no matter what epithelial tissue is on top, there is one and only one connective tissue that will form the base of a mucous membrane. Anyone know what that might be? Loose connective tissue? True, although we always want to be more specific than that. What's the most common loose connective tissue? Areolar. Areolar, right? Excellent. Excellent. An areolar connective tissue. So no matter what's on top, it is always going to be an areolar connective tissue that is underneath. Now, as we know, because I've mentioned it to you, areolar connective tissue is the most common tissue found in the body, the most widely distributed tissue in the body. So certainly here, as the base of the mucous membrane, is not the only place we find this areolar connective tissue, right? Just like this is most definitely not the only iPhone 8 or whatever it is on the surface of the planet. However, this one has my apps on it. This one's sitting on my desk. This one has my cover on it. So based on the location, this is Dr. Slutsky's phone. We can give it a name based on its location. 
And it's the same thing here with our areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue is found throughout the body, but an areolar connective tissue that is part of the, a mucous membrane, based on its location, we call it a lamina propria. All right. So notice, let's go back to the pretty picture from your textbook. Here is an example of a mucosa. Notice it's a dead giveaway, it's a mucosa because it has a goblet cell sitting in the middle of it. And goblet cells, of course, as we know, produce mucin and mucin is what lines a mucous membrane. Notice what epithelial tissue do we have on top here? Simple columnar. Simple columnar, excellent. So this whole thing, the epithelial tissue and connective tissue is a mucous membrane, but where is this mucous membrane likely from? Stomach. Yeah, or the small intestine or large intestine, probably found somewhere in the digestive system. Excellent. Notice underneath it, we have our realar connective tissue. It's not gonna have the cobwebby appearance, but we know that the connective tissue underneath the epithelial tissue of a mucous membrane is always going to be areolar connective tissue. And because of that, we always call it a lamina propria based on location. So it doesn't matter what epithelial tissue is on top, it's always in a real art connective tissue. And on the exam, we call it a lamina propria. And again, I want to beat the dead horse. That is how I will ask the question. Because on the exam, I could have an arrow like this pointing at a picture like this. And I could ask you two questions. Identify the tissue type and identify the tissue based on its location. If I ask you to identify the tissue type, what's the answer to that question? Connective tissue. And you get partial credit for that on the exam. Areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue, excellent. If instead I ask you to identify the tissue based on its location, what is your answer for that? Lamina propria. Perfect, there you go. Excellent. Questions on that? No one? I have a question. If you've noticed, I've written mucus, both M-U-C-U-S and M-U-C-O-U-S. And granted, you do get one letter while you're spelling on the exam, so it doesn't matter which way you spell it. But for argument's sake, which one's correct? O U S. Mucosa. Well, so mucosa, remember, is the noun that we uh, use for the membrane. That is the noun that stands for mucous membrane. So, which of these two things, mucus or mucus, is the correct way of spelling it? O U S. Are they referring to different things? Yeah, there you go. They are indeed. So, actually, technically, they are both. More fun with vocabulary. Right, mucus U.S. is actually the noun, right? I have a bucket of mucus on in, in my hand, right? When I then dump it on my sister, right? My sister would then be very mucusy, right? And that would be O-U-S, which is the adjective. So more fun with vocabulary. Technically both are correct. One is the adjective, one is the noun. All right. Yay. Fun with vocabulary. All right. Excellent. Let's talk about a serosa, a serious membrane now. Let's go back to our whiteboard and do some more writing. So our goal is now to understand a serious membrane, identify a serious membrane. And again, just like mucous membrane, it's also serosa and mucosa with vocabulary. And just like before, we need to worry about location and we need to worry about function. 
Now, we know a little bit about serous membranes. So let's add a little bit to the information we know. We know that there are really, I guess, three or six, depending on how you want to think of it. So let's go ahead and say six specific serous membranes. So let's identify the six specific serous membranes. Give me one. Plural. Oh, all right. Excellent. Uh, but can we be more specific plura. than that? Say again. Periatal pleura. Parietal pleura. Excellent. What else? Visceral pleura. Excellent. What else? Periatal pericardium. And visceral, visceral pericardium. pericardium. And periatal peritoneal. And visceral peritoneum. Excellent. So we know there are six specific serous membranes forming a cavity around the, the lungs, on the lungs, forming a cavity around the heart, on the heart, forming a cavity around the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity and on the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So notice once again, a serious membrane lines cavities, but what's different about these cavities versus the ones that have mucous membranes to them? Well, in, yep. in enclosed locations? Yeah, let's be specific in our wording. You're 100% correct, but let's be specific and let's be similar in our wording to the other one. There you go. Whereas mucous membranes line cavities that are open to the outside world, serous membranes line cavities that are closed to the outside world, right? If your thoracic body cavity, if your abdominal pelvic cavity are open to the outside world, please see a doctor immediately. All right. Now, we already morgue. did, I'm sorry? I said or a morgue. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, well, if you don't see a doctor, then you will see the morgue, absolutely. So what is the function of our serous membranes? Protection. Absolutely, how? What kind of protection? Uh, yeah, you were saying it, go ahead, you broke up. Like, like, like from friction. There you go. Protection from friction. And of course, how does it protect us from friction? With the fluids. What kind of fluid? Serous fluid. There Serous you know. fluid. Right. The same way mucous membranes produce mucus, serous membranes produce serous fluid. And that serous fluid protects us from friction, reduces the wear and tear on the movement of these organs. Awesome. So that brings us to the anatomy of it then, an epithelial tissue and a connective tissue. Now let's think about this. All of these cavities are closed to the outside world. So we don't have to worry about being thick and being protective. We just need a barrier. And we don't need it to be a very big barrier. So if I just need to make the thinnest barrier I possibly can, what would a good epithelial tissue be for that? Simple squamous. Exactly. So all serous membranes are going to be comprised of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Now, is this the only place we find a simple squamous epithelial tissue inside the body? No. No. So it turns out we can give this simple squamous epithelial tissue that is part of a serous membrane a name based on its location. And that name we give a simple squamous epithelial tissue that is part of a serous membrane we call a mesothelium.
Now, of course, this needs to be sitting on top of a connective tissue. And if you were going to randomly guess a connective tissue, which one should you guess? Areolar. There you go. Now, is this areolar connective tissue a lamina propria? No. No, because it's not part of a mucous membrane. So it doesn't have a name based on its location. But you don't truly get off easily because let's go back to that serious fluid. When we make that serious fluid inside of that serious cavity, is the goal to fill the cavity with as much of that fluid as you possibly can? No. No, you just want a thin layer of it. So we just want a thin layer So we just want a thin layer of that serous fluid on the surface of the membrane. And again, as we mentioned, serous fluid can be found in things like saliva. So clearly this isn't the only place we find serous fluid. So that thin layer of serous fluid that sits on top of a serous membrane gets a name based on its location. And the name we call that thin layer of serous fluid that sits on top of a serous membrane is transudate. I warned you there was a lot of vocabulary in this one. This was why we didn't do this at the end of class last time, because I knew this was going to be dense material because there's a lot of information. We've done it here with all the words. Let's look at the pretty picture. Here we see the pretty picture of our serous membrane. Again, it lines cavities that are open to the outside world, reduces that friction by producing that serous fluid. And here we see the nice illustration that shows us the anatomy. Notice we have a thin layer of serous fluid, that transudate, that sits on top of a simple squamous epithelial tissue that we call a mesothelium based on its location that sits on top of an areolar connective tissue, which if we followed all the other rules means it should have some name to it, but apparently they got tired at this point. So there is no fancy based on location name for an areolar connective tissue that's part of a serous membrane. We just have to worry about the epithelial tissue and the transudate. So that transudate is sitting on the sac that's housing the organs, like on the out and on the in? Yep, absolutely, both. Here, let's go to the whiteboard and draw this. As we talked about, an organ like the heart, let's go ahead and draw the heart. There you go. Pretty good anatomical uh, drawing of the heart. And as we know, there's going to be two serious membranes associated with this. Uh, so let's start first with the visceral that we know lines the surface. And we know that is continuous connected to the parietal that forms the cavity. So this is the visceral pericardium, and this is the parietal pericardium. If we were to take, let's do it here, a chunk of this out and look at this, basically, well, here, let's actually cheat. Let's do it this way, because it'll be easier. If I do it up here and take this chunk out, if you think about what we have here, and I'll do it with words rather than with drawings, Basically, the outer layer, we have the areolar connective tissue of the parietal peritoneum, no, pericardium, sorry. And then sitting on uh, uh, underneath that would be the simple squamous epithelial tissue, the mesothelium. And then sitting on top of that would be the transudate. 
Then there would be the pericardial cavity. And then there would be more transudate. And then there would be the simple squamous of the visceral pericardium. And then the areolar connective tissue. Uh, of the visceral pericardium. And then underneath that would be cardiac muscle. Right? So basically that would be, so notice the transudate lines both sides of the pericardial cavity, making them both slippery so that they glide against each other. Does that make sense? Excellent. In fact, it gets even better. Let's change the organ. Of course, as you can tell, this is a stomach. So if we were to look at the anatomy of the stomach, we know the stomach is connected to and located in the peritoneal cavity, the abdominal pelvic cavity. So of course, up here, we have the parietal, a peritoneum. And then here on the organ, we have the visceral. So let's go through the layers of that. First, on the outer surface, we would have a thin layer of transudate, the serous fluid that makes the outside surface of the stomach slippery. It sits on top of the simple squamous epithelial tissue of the uh, visceral peritoneum. Uh, uh, which of course, again, we call a mesothelium. That sits on top of an areolar connective tissue of the, and I'll just abbreviate it this time, visceral peritoneum, uh, because uh, I've already written it out once. That then sits on the smooth muscle layer really layers, it turns out there's three of them, of the stomach. And then underneath that, lining the uh, lumen of our stomach is going to be our mucous membrane. And that mucous membrane is comprised first of an areolar connective tissue, which, because it's part of the mucous membrane, based on location, we call the lamina propria. Sitting on top of that is a epithelial tissue. And what epithelial tissue would that be? Line in the inside of the stomach. Simple columnar epithelial tissue. Yep. Columnar epithelial tissue. And then sitting on top of that would be a thick layer of mucus. And there you go. Just that easily, we've made a stomach. The organ that is the stomach has a serous membrane on the outer surface, a mucous membrane on the inner surface, and three layers of smooth muscle in between. And that's pretty much how you make stomach. All right, questions on this? All right, excellent. So those are our first two membranes. But we still have two more. The next membrane is our synovial membrane. 
this synovial membrane is a specialized membrane. With special layers. Now, just like before, first let's identify its location and its function. Where are our synovial membranes located? Bone joints. Yeah, absolutely. These are found in our free moving joints. They line our free moving joints, which just happen to be called synovial joints because they're lined with a synovial membrane. And what is the function of our synovial membranes? Protection against friction of the bones. Once again, protection from friction. I'll provide cushion, you know, protection that way as well. And how does it produce, uh, protect us from friction and provide cushion for the bones? Synovial fluid? Yeah. Produces synovial fluid constantly. Now, is our goal here uh, to, uh, with this one, to just line the cavity with the synovial fluid? Fill it. Yeah, in this case, we want to fill the cavity. All right. Excellent. So we want to fill that cavity, provide that uh, cushion, provide that protection. Now, like all membranes, it is made up of an epithelial tissue sitting on top of a connective tissue. But remember, I said these are special layers. Let's actually cheat for a second. And here, I'm gonna erase this part and look back at the picture. Here we see a joint between two bones. We see the hyaline cartilage on the ends of them, providing that rubbery, uh, cushiony protection, reducing friction that way. Here we see that synovial cavity that is filled with fluid. And here in red, we see the synovial membrane. But notice they've taken a high magnification uh, illustration of this. And when you look at the epithelial tissue, does it really look like any of the epithelial tissues we've talked about? Notice there's a cluster of cells here and a cluster of cells here and a cluster of cells there. This is not a true epithelial tissue. Instead, it is what we call an irregular layer with clusters of cells, which is a lot of words. So we can also just abbreviate that to say it is a scant layer. It's not a true complete epithelial tissue. It's a scant layer, which is basically just a fancy way of saying there are small clusters of epithelial cells spread out on the surface. Right, so you can either say that small cluster of epithelial cells spread out on the surface, or you can just say that it's a scant layer. Is this the only place you'd find scant layers in the synovial membranes? The only one that you have to worry about so far. Okay. There are going to be a couple other players where you will other places where you will see incomplete epithelial layers, but this is the primary one we're going to worry about right now. Uh, and even the connective tissue. Again, what connective tissue would you expect to be here based on everything else we've done? And lo and behold, there also happens to be a name for it right here. What would you expect to be the epithelial? I mean, the connective tissue? Areolar tissue. Areolar, because it's pretty much found everywhere. Absolutely. But even the areolar connective tissue is a bit different on a synovial membrane. Notice how normally a, a real art connective tissues we think of as being a very loose tissue with a lot of open space. But here in our synovial membrane, it has many more fibers in it. So it has a much more extensive matrix, which you think about it makes sense. These are moving joints. We need to give this membrane a little bit more integrity so it stays together and it doesn't tear. 
So it has a lot more fibers. It's still in a real art connective tissue. It's still that loose a real art connective tissue, but it has a lot more fibers in it. So let's go back and finish our writing that we've been doing on all of this. Oh, that one's even smaller than what I was doing before. That's another good thing. All right. So again, epithelial tissue is a scant layer of clusters of spread out cells. And again, I'm writing all of that out for your benefit. You could just get scant layer on the exam and it's an areolar connective tissue with more extensive matrix contains more fibers or more strain. Excellent. Questions on that one? Nope. Excellent. That leaves us only one more membrane. And that one remaining membrane is our cutaneous. Membrane, which is also known as what? Skin. Excellent. Your skin is your cutaneous membrane. Your cutaneous membrane is your skin. So let's do the easy thing. Location, where is your skin located? Superficial body. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Superficial outer surface of the body. Excellent. What's its function? Many, protection. We'll start with protection. You're right. When we get to the integumentary system, we'll get much more specific about what its uh, true functions are in more detail. But protection, forming barriers from the outside world, that's a good start for now. Excellent. So what epithelial tissue helps to form our cutaneous membrane? Keratinized stratified squamous. Excellent. Keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. All right. And again, remember someone presents you with their epidermis, you should kiss it as long as they've given you consent. And what connective tissues, plural, are going to make up our cutaneous membrane. All right, let's start easy. Based on everything you've seen about all of the other membranes, what uh, connective tissue would you expect to find here as well? Areolar connective tissue? Yeah, because it's everywhere. And so not surprisingly, we find it here as well. However, from our other discussions, right, the deeper layer of our skin, the dermis, what, uh, what connective tissue did we say that was made up of? Dense, irregular. There you go. So there you go. Our cutaneous membrane is actually made up of an real art connective tissue that sits on top of two connective tissues, our areolar connective tissue and our dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, and, professor, okay. question. Uh, yes. Whenever we're referring to the dense irregular, do we need to say, uh, was it cold? So remember Col we could say- Collagenous or- no, uh, we know, uh, now, again, we know dense irregular connective tissues are made up of fibers, right? And they're primarily collagen fibers, but no, you don't have to say that it's a collagenous dense irregular connective tissue. The, uh, the, as I said, we can use the term dense connective tissue or fibrous connective tissue, right? Because they're very, pretty much interchangeable. Excellent, so we did location, we did function, we did the kissed epithelial tissue. And again, notice there are two 
connective tissue superficially, we have the areolar connective tissue. And deep to that, we have the dense irregular. And as I mentioned, this is chapter five. This is what we get to talk about next. So we are finally done with our discussion of tissues. How are we on time? We're doing great, perfect, excellent. So since we are done with tissues, before we go any further, let's beat this horse while it is still freshly dead. To do that, I need, okay, fine, don't do that. Um, <laughs> there's what I want. Do you still have uh, the notes on the whiteboard by chance? Uh, yeah. They assume so. There you go. Professor, I had a question. Yep. On the uh, what was the handout? Um, there was a section where we had to draw out uh, carotenized squamous stratified epithelial tissue, and um, one of the labels was for cutaneous membrane. So would that include both the, the dead cells and the non-carotenized cells? And more. That's exactly where I want to go. So I'm so glad you asked this question because this is exactly kind of the point that I wanted to make right here. So let's cheat and go to your precise question. Here, for instance, is, a, a, is the, a, the tissue that we looked at before for the skin, right? Correct? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So as we were talking about at the time, I could have an arrow pointing to something like this and ask you to identify the tissue type. And what was your answer to that? Stratified squamous. Which would get your Keratin partial credit. Keratinized. Uh, Keratinized stratified squamous. squamous. Excellent. Absolutely. But. The other thing I could do is I could remove that arrow and ask you to identify the membrane. What membrane would this be? Cutaneous. Cutaneous, Cutaneous Remember. membrane. Remember, membranes are comprised of two things, an epithelial tissue and a connective tissue. However, our cutaneous membrane is unique because how many uh, connective tissues is it comprised of? Two. Two. If you look closely, and this isn't the best example, I just grabbed this one because it was quick and easy. If you notice this tissue right here close to the surface and this tissue down here look different from each other. This one down here, and let's change the color of the arrow just to make it easy to discuss. Here with the red arrow, you can see, even at this low magnification, you can see all the collagen fibers. So the red arrow is pointing to what type of tissue? Dense irregular. Connected Dense tissue. irregular. But notice, and let's go ahead and, so I have three different colors. What, notice with the green arrow, the green arrow is pointing to a tissue that is clearly not the epithelial tissue. It's not very cell dense. But notice we're not seeing the fibers packed in it the same way we are with the red arrow. So guess what type of tissue the green arrow is pointing towards? Areolar. Areolar. Yeah. So again, notice this whole image in the field of view is the cutaneous membrane. It's the epithelial tissue plus the connective tissue underneath. All right. In this same fashion, notice here, this is a picture similar to the ones we were looking at before. 
And if I take my arrow and I point it right here like we did yesterday or two days ago and asked you to identify this tissue type, what would your answer to that be? Simple columnar. Simple columnar. Simple but what if I grabbed this arrow and moved it down here and asked you to identify this tissue? What tissue is this? Areolar. How do you know? I don't see cobwebby appearance like we were looking at it before. So how do you know this is areolar? It's the most common. Right. So if you don't know what to guess, that is what you should guess. Excellent. But is there a way we could have figured it out? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Yes. So let's walk our way through that. What tissue was this again? Simple columnar. Simple columnar. Where do you find simple columnar epithelial tissues? In the digestive In stomach. In the digestive stomach. Intestine, large intestine, small large intestine, small intestine. intestine, small intestine. All of which are hollow organs that are open to the outside world. So what type of a membrane is this simple columnar epithelial tissue comprised of? Mucosa. Mucous membrane or the mucosa, right? If you weren't 100% certain, they've even given us a goblet cell here to make this super easy. If I know this is a mucous membrane, then what connective tissue must it be sitting on top of? Areolar. Areolar, and I can do you one better. How would we identify this tissue based on its location? I'm in the Propria. 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 There you go. See how easy that was? Identify the membrane in the field of view. Sorry, I have a question about the previous slide. Yes. Uh, for the spaces like the white, would we um, can you use that as a identifier, like the ground substance being the water or, or the aerosol? This like that? No, inside the cell. Oh, you mean inside the connective tissue? It's yeah. Uh, yes, like I said, it doesn't have a cobwebby appearance but a real art connective tissue is a loose connective tissue with a fair amount of space in it. So yes, so that can help you to identify it. But the easier way to know that this is a real art connective tissue is to see that this is a simple columnar epithelial tissue. Know that simple columnar epithelial tissues are only found in mucous membranes. And if this is a mucous membrane, then this must be in a real art connective tissue. All right. Identify the membrane in the field of view. Membrane. I'm sorry. Mucous membrane. Mucous membrane. How do you know? Yeah. Well, with uh, the large cilia on top, it's a pseudo stratified um, columnar tissue, and that's found in the nasal cavity, uh, oh, where, yeah. or yeah. Perfect, absolutely. This is indeed a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, which is only found in the nasal cavity or the trachea, which tells me that this is definitely a mucous membrane, which also tells me, identify this tissue. Areola. Areola. <laughs> identify this tissue based on its location. Yeah. See how easy that was? Identify the membrane. Transitional membrane? Or uh, the membrane. Serious? Well, so again, so I, I like the way you were thinking there. Uh, it turns out this isn't transitional epithelial tissue, but I like the way you're thinking. But again, one of the things you have to remember as students, and, and, and Brian, I'm not trying to pull, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, make you stand out for it by doing this, but I think this is a great, uh, you reminded me of a great point that I want to make to people. You guys are smart, sophisticated students. And so one of the things that you should be careful about on the exam is paying really close attention to the questions. All right. 
if I ask you, for instance, to identify a cell, right? Or let me say it this way. If I ask you to identify an organelle, right? Is mucous membrane ever going to be the right answer for that? No, it's no. not. A, it's not an organelle. If I ask you to identify a membrane, how many possible right answers are there? Four. 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 What are they? Mucus. Serous membrane. Yeah. So not cutaneous. Cutaneous and smell. There membrane. you go. So even if you know nothing else, if you read the question and see that I'm asking you to identify a membrane, you being the smart, sophisticated students that you are should have a one in four chance of getting it right if you know nothing, because you know there's only four possible right answers. So that gives us a huge, of all the millions of answers that could be in added anatomy and physiology, if I ask for a membrane, you can whittle those down to four. So now that we've whittled it down to four, we have to figure out which one it is. So remember, one of the things we always talk about is to look at the top. What do you see on the apical layer of this tissue? Squamous cells. With nuclei or without nuclei? With, 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 nuclei. with nuclei. So what type of tissue is this on top? non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Excellent. And where might we find that? Inside the mouth. OK, that's one example. Where else? In the vaginal canal. Vaginal canal, anus. Urethra. Right? Yeah, urethra, uh, the distal end of the urethra, right? Because if you go more proximal, it's going to be transitional. But really, we could have stopped at the oral cavity of the mouth. Because if this is found in the oral cavity of the mouth, what type of membrane must this be? Mucus. Mucus, mucus membrane, All right? Excellent. So this is a mucus membrane, which also tells me what tissue is this? A real R. Can I identify tissue? this tissue based on its location? Lamina propria. Lamina propria. There you go. So you're absolutely right, Jacob. As you were looking at the handout, and we didn't talk about them last time, uh, when you were looking at the simple columnar, when you were looking at the non-keratinized, when you were looking at the skin, membranes were on there. I am asking you to identify the membranes. We didn't talk about them when we were going through the epithelial tissues and connective tissues, because we hadn't had a chance to put them together yet but I want that handout to be everything you're responsible for. So on an exam, I absolutely positively could show you a picture like this, could show you a picture like this and ask you to identify the membrane. But notice when I'm asking for the membrane, I'm not putting an arrow on there because the membrane is everything you see. Because right now you're seeing the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. And those are the two things you have to put together to make a membrane. All right. I said, I know there's a lot of vocabulary on this uh, and it does take some time to get used to it. But if you just stick with these basic rules, remember uh, what's on top, figure out the epithelial tissue, that'll really help you to figure out what kind of membrane it is. And then from there, it's all hopefully pretty simple and straightforward. All right. Questions on that. Out of deductive reasoning. Yes, but again, that's kind of what science is, right? You're collecting data and that's really what you do on an exam. You're collecting data using the information you know to figure out what the right answer is. That's what science is, that's what being a student is. Yes, some of it is just cram into your brain and recurgitate onto the page, but a lot of it is also you know, critical thinking, putting those pieces together. That's why I really like your lab manual handouts. You know, The lab manual handouts really emphasize the two important things you need to be successful. The check your recall is where you're just regurgitating information, right, that you've learned. You're labeling things or you're putting processes in order or something along those lines. Whereas the check your understanding, those essay questions, those are the ones where you have to kind of do more critical thinking, use the knowledge that you've gained to make a, you know, some deductive reasoning, uh, to, to make some leaps of understanding, to see how these things work together. 
And I think that those are great examples of the types of questions. In fact, some of the uh, questions from the lab manual end up in the uh, banks for the tests uh, for the essay questions, those uh, check your understanding ones, because they're good critical thinking types of questions. And so really, those are the two pieces of information. Yes, you have to do some deductive reasoning. You have to be able to put pieces together uh, to truly be successful. But with practice, you can do it. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. With that then, not only have we finished the histology that I wanted to uh, make sure we covered today because we got through all of our membrane stuff, but we are now done with our tissues. So what we need to talk about next Finally, I, again, it's it's silly that I keep saying finally because with summer school we've gone through this stuff so incredibly rapidly fast. We've basically covered a month's worth of information so far uh, to get to here in you know a few days. But uh, what we are finally going to be doing is get to our first organ system, the integumentary system, the skin. So for the rest of 430 and all 431, it's going to be all organ systems all the time. But of course, what are we gonna do? We're gonna look at those organs. We're gonna see the tissues that make them up. We're gonna figure out their functions. We're gonna identify the glands by their structure and their functional classification and all the fun things that go along with that. So that is our game plan moving forward. Excellent. So let's go ahead and take a break. Let all that membrane stuff uh, sink in. And I'll tell you what, rather than staying here on the pretty picture, I'll go ahead and leave you with this if this helps. Hopefully you've been writing this stuff down, but I'll leave you with this during the break. So let's go ahead and take our first break. It is 917. So that means coming back and we will restart at uh, 9. Did I say 17 or 7? Seven? 7, sorry. So let's come back and start at 922. And I will start the recording again at that part. All right, any questions on any of this membrane stuff before we take our first break? Hopefully going through the lecture slides, going through this with the words, and then going through the histology together helps to make some sense of this. And again, like all the lectures, the goal isn't for you to be a master of this information when I'm done talking about it, but I've exposed it to you. I've tried to guide you on how to prepare for it. And so hopefully you are now armed with the information so that you can study it and can master this material. So hopefully that will be the case. All right, see you back here in 15 minutes uh, at 922. So again, this is our first organ system. Like most organ systems, there are primary organs, which are responsible for the major functions of that organ system. And then there are accessory organs or accessory structures that help and assist in that process. And being an organ system, that must be true for the integumentary system. So of course, what is the primary organ of the integumentary system? Skin. Absolutely, it happens to be the largest organ of your body. And what are some examples of some of the accessory structures associated with it? What helps it to do all of its jobs? Hair. Excellent. Hair what? Sweat glands. Glands, excellent. And not just sweat glands, but all glands. Let's just go ahead and put glands. And I can think of at least one more thing. Nails? Yeah, there you go. Absolutely, excellent. So those are some examples of some of the accessory structures associated with this. And here we have the pretty illustration from your textbook that kind of shows, right, when we look down at the skin, all of the hunk and junk associated with it. All right, excellent. Now we've beaten around the bush a little bit with this. So let's talk about more specifically now the functions of the skin. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we said earlier was protection. But let's be more precise now. Protection from what? What does our skin actually protect us from? Bacteria, viruses. Right, harmful pathogens. 
we can lump those all together into one category, harmful pathogens, microscopic things that want to harm us. What else? UV light. I'm sorry, say again? Uh, UV light. Excellent. So radiation. Right, that UV radiation that can be damaging and destroying to our DNA, cause problems that way. Awesome. What else? From damaged deeper tissues. Yeah, absolutely. So like mechanical stresses. Right, scrapes, bumps, bruises, rubbing, tearing, all of those kind of things. Excellent. All right, so there's all this type of damage, mechanical stress, harmful pathogens, uh, harmful chemicals, right, acids and things along those lines. So it prevents, uh, provides a tremendous amount of protection for our body. Excellent, excellent, excellent. What else does our skin do besides protection? What uh, helps with the production of vitamin D. Excellent. So as we learned, it plays a role in our vitamin D uh, synthesis. As you learn, there's a special cholesterol located in our skin. Uh, that special cholesterol, uh, when exposed to UV radiation, not a lot, only about 15 minutes a day, is able to be converted into vitamin D. And any idea why vitamin D is so important? Uh, helps with calcium absorption. You can drink a whole cow's, excellent, we'll get to that one in a second. We can get to a whole cow's worth, you can drink a whole cow's worth of milk. If you don't have vitamin D, you're not gonna be able to absorb that calcium from the milk that you drink. It's vitally, vitally important that way. Now, the problem is we're all terrified of skin cancer and rightfully so. So we're always covering up or putting on sunscreen or it could just be that half the population is inside the house on TikTok all the time. And so as a result of this, none of us are getting the 15 minutes of sunlight we need to synthesize that vitamin D. So luckily, they put vitamin D into dang near everything. Uh, all, almost all milks now have vitamin D fortified in them. Even orange juices and other things like that have vitamin D in them to make sure that you're getting enough to get the calcium that you need. Excellent. It also helps to form a protective barrier and that important barrier, a uh, waterproof barrier, I like that. And again, that's for both ways of movement, both to uh, decrease water loss and water gain. As we talked about, when you take that bath, you don't blow up like a balloon from absorbing all that water that surrounds you. But at the same token, uh, maintaining the moisture inside of our body, because after all, remember 60% of our body weight is water, we want to be careful about losing it. Uh, if someone has 30 degree burns over major portions of their body, and they survive it, right? Then the two biggest concerns those individuals have are harmful pathogens that can now get into their body much more easier. And the other problem and concern is dehydration. So people with major burns are typically kept in a very humid, very moist, and very sterile environment to help with that water loss, to help with those harmful pathogens and to provide that protection. Another important function is our temperature regulation. I see that on here as well. Excellent. It helps to play a ro an important role in both maintaining our body temperature, helping us to radiate off heat, helping us to maintain our body temperature when we're cold. Huge, huge important function that way. Now, when we get back to this waterproof barrier, as we talked about, it is an important waterproof barrier to decrease water loss and gain. But is it a completely impenetrable barrier? No. No. So there is going to be some absorption and secretion that is going to take place through the skin. I think we talked about this already. If you want to stop smoking, one of the ways you can do that, or if you don't want to be bothered taking a birth control pill every day, there are patches you can put on the surface of your skin to absorb those lipid soluble uh, chemicals into your body to provide that protection from pregnancy, to provide that uh, nicotine so that you don't have to smoke. 
And at the same time, uh, we secrete uh, waste materials, not just water, uh, but ions. We talked about uh, someone who overindulges in alcohol, uh, sweating out that alcohol or sweating out that garlic from that big Italian meal, things along those lines as well. Excellent. I can think of at least one more really important function. Touch sensation. Absolutely, right? Our sensory sensation. As we talked about before, we receive a massive amount of information from the surface of our skin. Like I said, it's a fire hose of information that most of the time we're ignoring. Like we talked about the feel of the socks on your feet, the feel of the hat on your head, the feel of the chair on your back. These are information that is constantly coming into your brain. And most of the time we ignore that until someone like me points it out to you and then we pay attention to it again. All right, so massive, massive amounts of information. Excellent, I think that's all of them. We've written the list. Let's take a look at the pretty picture here. Protection, a physical, chemical, and biological barrier. That temperature regulation, cutaneous sensation. And again, we asked my 13-year-old, how many senses do you have? What's her answer to that going to be? Five. Five, absolutely. However, if you think of what we consider touch, Touch is everything like pressure, temperature, pain, tickle, itch, all sorts of different. I mean, that's five sensations right there, all using different sensory structures, all being processed by different parts of the brain. So clearly, uh, that whole five sense thing's going to have to be rethought when we get to the nervous system. Uh, some absorption and secretion. Again, as we mentioned, uh, it is primarily a waterproof barrier, but we do want to be able to let some things in and other things out. And then like we talked about, that vitamin D synthesis. Excellent. I think we hit all five. Spectacular. All right. Questions on that? All righty. Let's talk about the layers of the skin. All right, the components of the integumentary system. Here we see the picture of it. And here we see the main components of the skin. And those are the epidermis and the dermis. Those are the two main components of the skin. We'll talk about those general layers. And then each general layer is going to have specific layers associated with them as well. Right? Notice how tiny that epidermis is, right? It's a very small portion of our skin, but anybody have any idea how many sublayers, or actually that's a better term than specific layers, sublayers, how many sublayers there are to the epidermis in that tiny little layer? Three. three. More than three. It's either four or five, depending on what part of the skin we're talking about, as we'll see. So again, such a tiny portion of the skin, and yet there's a whole lot going on in there that we need to talk about. So again, skin is the largest organ of the body. The study of the skin is the field of dermatology. And as we just finished pointing out, the skin consists of two primary parts or as I mentioned, two primary layers. And those layers are the epidermis and the dermis. And remind me again, what tissue forms that superficial epidermis layer? Keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial. There you go. Oops. These terms will eventually start rolling off your tongue super, super easily, uh, but excellent, excellent. The keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And what tissues, plural, comprise the dermis? Areolar connective tissue. And dense irregular connective tissue. Perfect. Excellent. And that's it. The skin is our largest organ of the body, and it is primarily just made up of these three layers of tissue. 
a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, a thin layer of a real art connective tissue, and a dense irregular connective tissue. Biggest organ in the body, and it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now notice, if we jumped back to that picture, one of the things we would have seen underneath the skin is those layers that was yellow on the picture with all those yellow circles on it. And that represented what is known as the hypodermis. This is the area underneath the skin uh, that is comprised of areolar and adipose connective tissue, right? Here in my midsection, I have plenty of adipose in that hypodermis underneath the skin, right? But here on my forearm, it's mostly just a real art connective tissue. So everybody has a hypodermis. The only difference is how much is a real R and how much is adipose. But notice the names. This layer is what is referred to as the hypodermis. What does hypo mean? Under. Under. So this is below the dermis. This layer is called subcutaneous. What does sub mean? Under. Under. It is under the cutaneous membrane. If you are under the cutaneous membrane, can you be a part of the cutaneous membrane? No. No. That layer of areolar connective tissue and adipose is important for the function of the skin but it is not a part of the skin, All right? It helps to hold the skin in place. It attaches the skin to the muscles underneath, but it is not a part of the skin. I've kind of given you a little bit of it, but let's be more specific. Why is this hypodermis so important? What is its function? Storing fat. Absolutely. One of the things is to provide storage. As we said, that adipose is going to uh, provide a storage of uh, triglycerides in them. Why is that storage of triglycerides important in the subcutaneous layer? Insulation. Excellent. One is it helps with the temperature regulation. It provides some insulation, right? Uh, one of the things that you notice with people when they have massive weight loss is they tend to get very, very cold because they've lost that insulative layer. What else? Energy. Energy. It's stored energy. Absolutely. Triglycerides have lots of uh, uh, covalent bonds that can be broken. And what else? Attaching the uh, upper skin layers to the bones. Absolutely correct. That wasn't what I was thinking of. We'll get that, to that one in a second. But the other thing, remember, is also it provides some protection. Right? Those were things that we already talked about with that, you know, helping to protect the organs underneath. But you are absolutely correct. The other major important function it has with the skin is not just that it connects the skin to the muscle, but how it connects the skin to the muscle. Right? Because I know with it being 110 degrees outside right now, you aren't thinking about this, but I certainly am. Uh, Halloween is right around the corner. All right, Halloween is one of my favorite holidays, was one of my favorite holidays growing up, continued to be one of my favorite holidays. And then Big, my oldest daughter, was actually born on Halloween, making Halloween even more special. So of course, especially now that she's 17, she loves that every year I do the exact same uh, uh, costume for Halloween. I strip down to my tightest pair of shorts, I uh, paint my entire body green, and I run around as the Incredible Hulk. And while it looks awesome, for the first half an hour or so. After that paint dries and I continue to move around, what starts to happen to that paint on the surface of my body? Crack and fall off. Yeah, it starts to crack and splinter and fall off. And the reason for that is those pesky muscles, right? Muscles are actually called muscles because of the Greek word for mouse. Because the Greeks thought when you contracted the muscles, the muscles as they changed shape looked like little mice running around underneath the surface of the skin. So that's where muscles got their name. And that's the thing. If the skin was directly attached, right, like that paint to the surface of the muscles, as the muscles change shape, it would put tremendous stress on the skin and could actually cause the skin to tear, to be damaged. 
So what our hypodermis does is it loosely connects the skin to the muscles, allowing the muscles to move around underneath without damaging the skin on the surface to maintain that integrity, to maintain that protection, even as we're moving around through space. All right, so it is very, very important, it serves a lot of important functions. It's just not a part of the skin. It's associated with the skin, but it is not a layer of the skin. The skin just has two layers, epidermis and dermis. All right, questions on that? And no, I don't really dress up as a Hulk. All right, excellent. So epidermis, as we know, is comprised of a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which I've written enough times now where I can probably just abbreviate it for this quick part here. And like all tissues, it is comprised of cells. All right, there are four main types of cells that are found in the epidermis arranged to form the layer of the epidermis. And not surprisingly, the vast, vast majority of those cells are cells called keratinocytes. With a name like keratinocytes, what do you think keratinocytes do? Produce keratin. They produce keratin, absolutely. Keratin, or what is also uh, made up of keratohyalin granules, are <coughs> excuse me, are thick fibrous proteins. These thick fibrous proteins are what make the skin cells thick, make the skin cells hard, provide that protection. One of the interesting things about these keratinocytes is they will produce so much keratin, fill themselves with so much keratin, that essentially they decide they don't need the nucleus in any of these pesky organelles anymore. And they basically chuck it, becoming big, hard, flattened, dead cells, providing that big, thick, protective outer coating of our skin. Now, notice I've said hard, notice I've said protective, but they also play an important role in that waterproof barrier. The reason they're able to produce a waterproof barrier is they actually produce a second type of granule called a lamellated granule. And these lamellated granules basically uh, wax and fuse the keratinocytes together, helping to hold them together, forming a protective layer, that protective barrier that helps to stop the water loss or water gain. And again, these make up close to 99% of the cells of the epidermis. So if you were to take a dart and throw it at the epidermis, A, it would hurt, but B, uh, you would most likely hit a keratinocyte. They make up 99% of the cells that make up the epidermis. So when pointing at the epidermis of the skin and I ask you to identify the cell, your best bet answer is gonna be a keratinocyte. However, 99% is not all. There are some specialized cells in this epidermis as well. And the first of these are what are known as melanocytes. Melanocytes produce a pigment called melanin. And that is the primary coloration of the skin. Again, as you learn from that biointeractive, for the most part, most people have a similar number of melanocytes. However, even with the few windows that are open on right now that we can see the cameras of, does everybody have the exact same uniform uh, coloration to them? No. No, because while we all have similar numbers of cells, there are two big differences in the melanocytes. The first is in the color of the pigment. There have been over four genes that have been found to play a role in helping to produce the pigment of the skin. And each one of those genes has at least two versions, a lighter color and a darker color version of that gene. 
So for instance, if all four genes all had the light color, you would have a very pale pigmentation color to you. And if all four had the darkest color, you would tend to have a very dark coloration to your pigment. Now, of course, which pigment you produce is genetically determined. So if I had two identical twins, are they always gonna be the exact same color? No. No, why not? Uh, guessing here, but on the exposure to of the UV radiation? Absolutely. If one of those twins is inside on the PlayStation all the time and the other one spends every day outside on a skateboard, they're going to have different colorations to their skin because it's not just the color of the pigment where the melanocytes vary, but also the amount of pigment they produce. And with that amount of pigment that they produce, there also can be modified by, as you pointed out, UV radiation. So some people's melanocytes produce more, some people's produce less, but everybody's produce more when exposed to UV radiation. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it is, I, I think, I think it is an important thing. Because again, there is so much social connotation to skin color, right? It's depressing how much. Uh, but um, from a biological standpoint, it is an interesting process, not necessarily significant in, in, in affecting anything other than really helping in protection from UV radiation. Uh, but I think it is an important thing to understand. Now, there are some interesting more things about these melanocytes. Let's go to the whiteboard and do some real quick drawing. Here is a chunk of my skin. And I'll just do this simple down near the base of the epidermis where we have our keratinocytes. So here are my keratinocytes, all ducks in a row and stuff. And they have their nuclei. where their DNA is located. What's interesting about these melanocytes is these melanocytes typically are located in the very deepest layers of the epidermis, down at the bottom of the epidermis. But they have these long, like finger like extensions that extend up into the layers of the epidermis. And what they do is they make their melanin, they bundle it in a vesicle, and then they transport it out these finger like extensions where they release that vesicle to one of the keratinocytes. And what the keratinocytes do is they collect those granules and they take that melanin and basically use it to produce an umbrella that protects their nucleus from that UV radiation. Awesome, very helpful, very useful, but there's only two major problems with this. Right During the summer, you're probably spending a tremendous amount of time inside studying. So you're not outside playing a whole lot. So you may be getting more and more pale by the minute. However, the weekend's coming up. And so maybe you decide to go up to Tahoe for the weekend and sit out on the lake all day long. And if you're exposed to that UV radiation for a long period of time, not to the point where you get burned, but just you know normal natural amounts, uh, what happens to the color of your skin? It's gonna get dark. You get darker. darker, absolutely. The reason for that is, as we mentioned, the amount of melanin that our melanocytes produce is based on UV radiation. So even though it's at the bottom of our epidermis, UV radiation still gets down here and still stimulates it. And when it stimulates it, it produces more granules to provide more protection so that your skin gets darker in color and provides more protection. But to get that more protection, that UV radiation has to have an effect on our melanocytes. And here's the other problem with the melanocytes. While it's producing all this melanin to protect the keratinocytes, 
it doesn't keep any of it for itself. So does it have any protection for its nucleus from this UV radiation? No. no. And so when that UV radiation stimulates the melanocyte to produce more melanin, that UV radiation has the potential to damage the nucleus of that melanocyte. And what happens when this melanocyte gets damaged in just the right or really just the wrong way where that UV radiation causes it to start to divide uncontrollably? Melanoma. It becomes cancerous. It becomes a melanoma. And while nobody wants any type of skin cancer, if you have to have a skin cancer, is melanoma the one you want? No, melanoma is incredibly aggressive, right? It is a type of uh, cancer that metastasizes quickly, is very aggressive, and uh, can kill people within months of diagnosis. Right, so you can see why nobody's getting their uh, vitamin D from the old ways in the sun, right? It's scary. This kind of sun is a scary thing. Being outside is a scary thing. We should all just stay home under our beds and learn TV on and learn information on Zoom. All right, because the world is scary. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's go back here. That is our melanocyte. And again, if you don't like my drawing, here's the pretty picture from your textbook that shows this as well. There are two other specialized types of cells uh, that we need to talk about as well. The first are what are called epidermal dendritic cells. Epidermal, because they're in the epidermis. Dendritic just means process. It has all these little finger-like extensions that stick off of it. So that is why it is called an epidermal dendritic cell. Of course, it's also called Langerhans cells. And why would they be called Langerhans cells? Mr. Langerhan is the one who found it. Good old Bob Langerhan was the first one who identified it and planted his flag in it. Absolutely. These cells are actually much closer to white blood cells than they are to skin cells. They play an important role in our immune response, primarily uh, in two ways. The first way is that they contain our friend histamine. What did histamine do again? Inflation? Uh, inflammation? inflammation? Yeah, inflammation, absolutely. Right? Many of you, and again, with us being 22 in here, only about 25% of the population is immune to it. So I'm certainly there's somebody in here who's had it before, right? You go camping for a weekend, you don't pay, pay attention to that whole leaves of three, don't touch me thing, and you get some poison oak or poison ivy on the surface of your skin. And what happens as a result of that? Swelling. Yeah, you get a rash as a result of that. That rash is because of the inappropriate release of histamine, causing that redness, causing that swelling, causing those hives, that pain and discomfort as a result of that. All right. So again, that inflammation of the skin occurs because of that histamine that can be released from these. These cells also are phagocytes. Remember, phagocytes are the cells that take some harmful pathogen and bring it inside, break it down with their lysosomes to destroy that harmful pathogen. But what we didn't talk about phagocytes is not only do phagocytes break down pathogens, but then they like to show it off. It's like a cat, right? If your cat truly loves you, then one of the things it will do is go outside, kill a bird, and then bring it and put it on your pillow so that you'll be proud of it, right? Look what I just killed. Well, that's kind of what our epidermal dendritic cells do. Once they gobble up a pathogen, they show it off to the body. Say, hey, look at this bad thing I just ate so that your body can start to build up a defense to it. So it plays a huge, huge role in our immune response. Very important for that. So um, when you have a, a rash on the skin due to the allergy? Yes. So this is how? Exactly. So yes, when you have an allergic reaction, those hives that come up as a result to the skin, it is because of that inappropriate, again, 
getting inflamed when you're injured is appropriate. Uh, inflammation is an appropriate response when injured. However, the problem with allergies is that you are getting an inappropriate response, something that is normally benign, like pollen, like a cat dander, like peanut proteins, things along those lines. Uh, those things are things that are normally benign, but for whatever reason, people's bodies uh, react poorly to them, build up a defense to them. And so one of the things that happens is when these Langerhans cells release those histamines, uh, you get hives on the surface of your skin. That is correct. Or a contact dermatitis for that matter as well. I guess it doesn't have to be an ingested allergen. It can be a surface allergen as well. And that's what poison ivy is. Poison ivy is actually an allergic reaction to the oils in that. So, yeah. Great question. Any others? Which, which that oil from that is just a protein, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oil from that is just a protein that your body can't. Or your, yeah, your port, your body. Typically, what happens with these, they're what we call incomplete antigens. Often, what happens is they bind to another protein in your body. And when that happens, it causes uh, uh, that allergic reaction. We'll talk about this more when we get to the immune response in 431. But, but at its, in, in its simplicity, that's exactly what happens. So, one of the things that's really dangerous about uh, the poison ivy, right? Even if you don't touch it, if, for instance, you're out camping and have a fire and put some on it, and then inhale the smoke from that, those oils, those proteins from the smoke of that can actually cause that uh, inflammatory response in the respiratory tract. So it can be very, very bad that way. Yeah, I got sent to the hospital. Somebody burned some poison oak. No oh, bueno. There you go. Exactly. Absolutely. Yikes. Glad that you're okay. All right. One last important cell that we would see inside of the uh, epidermis, and these are tactile cells. Tactile cells are also known as Merkel discs, and of course, why are they called Merkel discs? Good old Bob Merkel. Good old Bob Merkel. Uh, the first one who discovered it, planted his flag in it, and named it after himself. These are special tactile sensation cells that provide fine discrimination. When we're talking about touch and fine discrimination, if you had a pocket full of change, I know with, uh, again, with quarantine, I have to work on my analogies because now with quarantine, I know coins are one of the most scarce things on the planet. But back in ancient times, there were these things called coins and you could have a pocket full of them. And if you reached into your pocket without looking, you could pull out a quarter without even looking. And how were you able to do that? How could you figure out in a pocket full of change, which one was the quarter? Second. Say again. Size and the, ri the ridges. Yeah. Size is definitely one of them, but the second characteristic are those ridges on the outer side that you can feel with your fingers. That ability to feel those fine little ridges, that's what I'm talking about by fine discrimination. Now, are these tactile cells equally distributed throughout your entire surface of your body? No. No, they're on all over. but they are unequally distributed. Where do you have the most of them? Fingertips. Yep, hands, especially the thumb and fingers. Where else? Feet and toes. That's a good guess, but it's not actually the feet and toes. There's something else in the feet and toes we'll talk about a little bit later. Hands, especially the thumb, and one other place as well. The palm? Well, I, I, that would be part of the hand. You're right. Palm of the hand, fingers, especially the thumb. Where else? Taking Where a guess out here. Where else might you find them? The tongue. In your mouth? Close. Face. Especially the lips. These are the areas where you have the highest density of these, the most taste sensation. So for instance, not taste, but the most uh, fine discrimination. So again, if I took a nickel and a quarter and I rubbed the edges of them on your back, would you necessarily be able to tell which one was the quarter and which one was the nickel just by the edge on your back? 
No, but if I did that on your lip, would you be able to tell the difference? Or your thumb, would you be able to tell the difference? Absolutely. And again, these are things you may not have ever thought about on your own, but these are things that you are aware of. Because how does a baby explore the world? With their mouth. Yeah, they grab things with their hands and they shove them into their mouth, right? Why are they doing that? Because their hands and their face are where all these major tactile cells are located. And so they're getting a massive amount of information by doing that. All right. So when, when you have a newborn baby and you touch uh, her to the chick and the baby is opening the mouth, just because, uh, just because what? <laughs> well, no, it, well, the, the, the short answer to your question is that is an innate reflex. That is a reflex baby are born with called the suckle or the latching reflex. You're absolutely what? correct. When you touch the cheek of a baby, a baby tries to turn and tries to latch on because that's how they survive, right? They're presented with the nipple. They have to find the nipple, grab onto it and start sucking so that they can get their nourishment. Yeah, so, and their ability to feel that brushing of the skin is in part because of these tactile cells. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. So those are the four cells. I will tell you right now that these two cells, the Langerhans cells and the Merkel cells, you need to know, you need to understand their function, but I am not going to make you identify them histologically. Is it possible to see these under a microscope? Yes, absolutely. Am I going to make you do that on the exam? No. But know where they're located. Uh, no, and I guess we didn't really talk about where they're located. So let me do that. The tactile cells are at the very bottom of the epidermis, kind of where the, uh, where the melanocytes are located. And what's interesting about these dendritic cells is they can actually move through the cell layers. Now the deep cell layers Of the, of the epidermis. So they can move around a bit within the deep uh, cell sublayers of the epidermis. So they have the ability to kind of migrate around, which makes sense. If you want that protection, you want them to be able to migrate around. All right, so again, you need to know them, you need to know what they are, but I'm not gonna hold you for them under a microscope. However, under a microscope, you definitely need to know the keratinocytes. After all, when we look here, you see practically nothing but keratinocytes. And also, as I'll show you, you're gonna be responsible for the melanocytes as well. All right, so questions on the cell types that make up the epidermis. Uh, yeah, on the, on the Merkel tactile cell, you yep. have it, it's attached to a sensory neuron. Is every cell attached to a sensory neuron? No. Again, this is a special sensory structure that provides a sen special sensory information. So anything that provides a sensory information, pressure, pain, tickle, itch, tactile sensation, fine discrimination, all of those things have to have nerves that carry them to our brain. Right. This Langerhan cell, for instance, is just providing defense. Right. The keratinocytes are just forming the barrier. The melanocytes are merely producing pigment. So those things don't need to carry information to our brain. Sensory things do. Yeah, so is there a sensory neuron per cell? Not per cell. A single sensory neuron can receive thousands of inputs from different types of Merkel cells or Merkel disks or other types of things. And we will actually go through more sensory structures. We will do that, I promise. Excellent. All right, so let's talk, now that we have the cells, let's put them together into the epidermis. As I mentioned, the epidermis is made up of either four or five distinct strata. And really the key word here should be sublayers. Maybe I'll actually change that on the slide. I like that, let's do that.
So comprised of four or five sublayers. And the difference is whether they are thick or thin skin. Thick skin is comprised of five layers, whereas our thin skin is comprised of four layers. Now, what's the difference between thick and thin skin? Well, obviously the number of layers, but what else is different about them as well? The amount of protection that like portion of the body needs. Right, absolutely. Not only does thick skin have five layers, but it also in general has more cells in it, making it thicker, hence the name, to provide more protection. Maybe it helps if we figure it out this way. Where do you find thick skin? Rough patches of the skin, the feet. Okay, feet, soles of the feet, uh, bottom of the toes, where else? Hands, palms. Palms of the hands, right? And the fingertips. Notice the back of your hand, is that thick skin? No. How do you know? What's the other big difference between the palm of your hand and the back of your hand? If you're not sure, look at it. What do you notice that's different? The uh, ridges. Texture, absolutely. The thick skin has textures to it. So does your feet, the bottom of your feet. What's the other big difference as you look at the palm of your color. hand and the back of your hand? Sure, color. pigmentation can be. Although the color really has to do more with the thick set cell layers. If you look at it under the microscope, color-wise, they don't necessarily have a dramatically different amount of pigment. These just, by having more skin layers, less of that pigment shows through. What's the other big difference? Look closely at the palm of your hand and the back of your hand. What do you notice? Hair. There you go. Absolutely. Thick skin does not have hair on it. Thick skin is hairless skin, right? No matter what type of activities you participate in by yourself this weekend, no hair is going to grow on the palm of your hands, right? Thick skin is hairless skin. There is no hair on the thick. So there are more cell layers, more cells, more protection, lighter color, and no skin. That is the big difference, right? Here, we see a light microscopy view of the skin. And this happens to be thick skin, because as you can see, there are five sublayers to it. And I will tell you right now, the big difference between thick skin and thin skin is this layer right here. The stratum lucidum is in thick skin only. Oops, it's only. The other important thing to remember is typically when we identify the layers of the skin, we do it from the basal surface up, right? Normally we would think you would go superficial to deep, but with skin, we primarily identify the layers by where they start growing and where they go to. So these cells start at the very bottom work their way up to the top, which as we talked about, they then slough off and become the dust around your house. So that layer is the stratum germinativum, stratum spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and then the stratum corneum. Now the stratum germinativum is also known as the stratum basal because it is the bottom layer basal layers, and that is a perfectly acceptable uh, name for it. Any appropriate anatomical term is fine. So if I ask you on the exam with a big, huge arrow to identify this specific sublayer, and you want to say stratum basal because it's easier to spell, that is fine. However, make sure you know straight um, of these terms, because if I ask you the function of the stratum germinativum, make sure you know the answer to that. So again, recognize both terms, but as always, you may use any appropriate anatomical term you want. And if you like the one that's easier to spell, I'm totally okay with that. Now, the other thing, and I know I'm speaking with several of you uh, that um, 
Again, you like your visualizations, you like your mnemonics, and that is how I learn as well. I am a very visual and a very tactile learner. So mnemonics are things that are very important to me. In fact, I will share with you my favoritist mnemonic of all times. There you go. Is that a sad commentary on today's society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be, but that's not what it is. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in fifth grade. On fifth grade, they came up to us one day and said, guess what? Next week on Tuesday, the United States is going to the metric system. And so everybody needs to learn the metric system because the whole world is metric. And on Tuesday, we're going metric too. Now, again, this was fifth grade and this was the mnemonic that our teacher gave us. So that again, tells you something about the uh, uh, education I got. Of course, I grew up back East in Ohio, so that might explain it. Um, but the point being, this was the mnemonic they gave us to help us learn the metric system, right? Because if you think it in terms of meters, you have kilometers, hectometers, decameters, meters, decimeters, centimeters, millimeters. Way back in fifth grade, and even though that was 872 years ago, I still remember it, right? Of course, Tuesday came and we never went metric, but they taught me this mnemonic and it has stuck with me ever since, all right? So when we look at this one again, there are lots of mnemonics that I've heard students have come up with in the past. Uh, my favorite one, and this one uses stratum basel, If you think of them in terms from, again, superficial to deep, as they work their way up, stratum basel, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum, the one a student came up with, gosh, must have been like 10 years ago now, and I still like it. It's boys stink, girls like candy. So there you go. You got that one or any other mnemonic you need to help you to remember these layers and to keep them in mind as we work our way through them. All right. So let's work our way through them. And let's do this two ways. I'm going to draw this. And for simplicity, I'm going to draw the boundary between the dermis and the epidermis as just a straight line. Uh, as we'll see from the pictures, it's clearly more undulating than that, but this makes my art a little bit easier. So here is my epidermis, and then up here we're going to focus on the sublayers of the epidermis. And the first as I mentioned, is the stratum basal or the stratum germinatavum. Basal obviously means base. What does germinate mean? Like cell generation? Yeah, germinate means to give life to. And that's basically what we have here. The stratum germinatavum is a single layer of keratinocytes. These keratinocytes are columnar or cuboidal in shape. But they're the first and the sole layer a single layer of keratinocytes. Now, as the name indicates, not only is it the basal layer, but it germinates. These are our unipotent stem cells. Remember, the job of unipotent stem cells is to divide and make new cells. And remember, our epidermis is made up of an epithelial tissue, and it is avascular. 
However, here in the dermis is where we're gonna have all the capillaries. And those capillaries are gonna be able to give nutrients to this layer because it's the closest. So it's gonna get the most nutrients, the most oxygen, the most resources, because as we know, dividing requires a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of resources. So here in our stratum basal is where we have those unipotent stem cells dividing rapidly. And when they divide, they make how many things? Two. Unipotent stem cells make how many things? Oh, mm -hmm. they were talking about the cell itself was no, making no. two cells. Yeah, divided. one cell makes two cells, but that new cell that it makes, what does it become? Also a keratinocyte. Yeah. One thing and one thing only, makes new keratinocytes. Now, this layer will also be where we find our Merkel cells and our melanocytes. So let's go ahead and put a melanocyte in here with its wiggly processes. Let's make that a little bigger. But this can also be where we would find our Merkel disc or tactile cell. And let's give it a nerve coming out of that as well. Within this layer. All right, excellent. So we have that. Let's go back to the pretty picture from your textbook so that we're not just relying on my drawing. Notice we can very, very clearly see the boundary between the cell dense uh, epidermis and the cell sparse dermis, the difference between the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. And again, notice there are large undulations in it. I just made it flat to be easy for us. And as I mentioned, our uh, first layer, the stratum basal or stratum genitatum, is just that single first layer of keratinocytes. So just that very first layer right on the boundary of our dermis. Single layer of keratinocytes, highly mitotic, but can contain the melanocytes, the Langerhans cells, the Merkel cells. I'll draw a Langerhans cell in just a minute, but uh, those other things can be found there as well. Now, remember, as I mentioned, I'm not going to make you learn the Langerhans cells and the tactile cells histologically, but let's look at another slide of the epidermis. Notice when I look at this slide of the epidermis, and let's make this as easy as possible. Nope, don't like that one. Identify this cell. Mm. So, non keratinized cell, not tissue type, identify the cell. You guys are overthinking this. We're in the epidermis. When you throw a dart, what should you hit? Keratinocyte. A keratinocyte, absolutely. What's this one? Same thing. Keratinocyte. keratinocyte. What's that one? Keratinocyte. What's that one? Keratinocyte. What's that one? Keratinocyte. Yeah. Again, chalk filled with keratinocytes. However, notice this cell right here. One of these things is not like the others. Notice what in particular is different about this cell is it has a very clear cytoplasm. Because remember, as we said, 
while melanocytes provide tremendous amount of pigment to the other cells, they don't keep any of it for themselves. So this very light colored cytoplasm of this cell is a dead giveaway that this cell, unlike pretty much every other cell, notice it looks like there may be a half a one here that was cut in half when we made the slide. But other than these one and a half cells, everything on here is a keratinocyte. But th this one I wouldn't use on the exam, but this one, absolutely I will. This cell is dramatically different from all the others. So this cell is clearly something different. And what is this something different that it is? Uh, melanocyte. These are the melanocytes, exactly. So again, here, this single layer of cells right on the floor of the epidermis is the sublayer, the stratum germinativum, made up of a single layer of keratinocytes that are dividing rapidly, but we can find the melanocytes there as well. Now, like I said, Langerhans cells and tactile cells will be here as well, but you don't need to know those histology. This is pretty clear histologically, so I have no problem holding you responsible for recognizing something like that. All right, questions on that? Nope. Excellent. Let us then move to our second layer. Notice as these keratinocytes divide and produce more and more keratinocytes, they are gonna push those keratinocytes upward. And as we push those keratinocytes upward, we start to get multiple layers of cuboidal and columnar cells. And let's do one more quick thing. Remember, these cells are still living cells. They still have nuclei. So let's put a nucleus in a couple of these so that we remember that. And we can do the same thing for these cells. These are still living cells with nuclei. Again, I won't put them in all of them because it'll take too long, but you get the idea. This brings us to our second layer, second sublayer, I should say. Let's be precise with my wording. And that is the stratum spinosum. Now, these are layers of newly divided keratinocytes. As I mentioned in these deep sublayers, uh, we could also have our dendritic cell. So let's go ahead and put a dendritic cell in here because again, it can be in the deep layers or it can be here with its processes that stick out, migrating through. But these newly divided keratinocytes are further away from the blood vessels. They are no longer dividing. And so instead, still being alive, still being cells, they're gonna do what cells do. And they are gonna start making proteins. Now, with a name like keratinocyte, what protein do you think they would most likely be making? Keratin. Keratin, but it turns out they're not quite doing that yet. Instead, they're making proteins to form cell junctions. So actually, before we start making those keratins, uh, what these cells are going to start doing is they are going to start making uh, cell junctions, specifically those desmosomes. Remember those desmosomes, as we talked about, were those spot welds that are gonna hold these cells really, really tightly together. And that's actually where this cell layer gets its name. Because of all these desmosomes that are forming on these cells, when you look at them really closely with a really, really high resolution microscope, these desmosomes give the cell a spiny appearance. And so that's where it gets its name, spinosin 
because of the spiny appearance because it starts to make massive numbers of desmosomes, which if you remember are the ones that hold the cells tightly together. So that is our stratum spinosum. Let's look at it on the light microscopy, right? From that first cell layer up, we have somewhere on the order of, I don't know, eight to 10 layers of keratinocytes that are no longer dividing. Instead, they're making cell junctions. They're making desmosomes, giving it that strength, that flexibility, holding these cells together. And it's what gives this layer its name. All right, questions on that? All right, as the cells leave the stratum spinosum, they start to change more dramatically. And they form the stratum granulosum. Remember, all these cells up to this point of time have all been kind of cuboidal or columnar in shape. But now what's starting to happen is the cells are flattening and the cells are elongating. Again, for simplicity, I'm drawing these as all stacked together. Obviously that's not gonna be the case, but you get the idea. What we have now are layers of flattened keratinocytes. And now our flattened keratinocytes are really doing the major protein synthesis. Now, remember that involves two types of uh, granules, both the keratohyalin and the lamellar granules. And this again is what gives this layer its name. When we look at this layer, what we see, and I'll go ahead and cheat and do it this way, is that there is a massive amount of these protein granules in here. And these protein granules tend to be a little bit more lipid based. And these end up taking on a massive amount of stain. So this layer typically tends to be very flat, but also very dark in color. Let's cheat and go back to our illustration to see this. Notice here in this region, very dark, very flat stains in uh, flat, uh, sorry, very flat keratinocytes, very darkly stained area because of this major amount of protein synthesis that is going on. Remember the cratohyalin granules form our keratin, giving it its strength. And that lamellar granules are what are fusing the cells together, making them waterproof. Now, let's go back to the illustration for a second. These cells fill up with so much keratin that as I mentioned, they decide to chuck their nucleus and all of their organelles. Now, if you don't have a nucleus and an organelle anymore, can you make proteins? Can you repair yourself? Can you deal with any damage to the cell or anything like that? No. 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 And if you're fusing yourself together, making this waterproof shield, yes, no water can get in, but that also means water can't get out. These cells can't get rid of their waste. These cells can't get new oxygen and new nutrients. So Samuel pointed out, these cells die. And not just randomly, 
they undergo a, a specialized program cell death. At the end of this level, this sublayer, the cells undergo a process of programmed uh, cell death. And anybody know what the fancy term for that program cell death is? There we go. They undergo apoptosis. What that means is every cell above this layer is a dead keratinocyte. So basically from this layer down, all the cells are alive. From this layer up, whoops, all the cells are gonna be dead. So notice here, and just out of curiosity, do you think this is thin skin or thick skin as we look at it? Thick skin. Thick skin. Just out of curiosity, how many cells do you think are in this region of the skin right here? Cells or layers? Cells. Millions? Yeah, well, or at least in this part that we're looking at, even just on this slide, at least thousands. Do you see any nuclei in any of them? No, because every single cell from this layer of the stratum granulosum up is a dead skin layer. Excellent. All right. As those Professor, cells... Yes. Sorry. Is, there, is there something in that cell? I mean, I, I know that it like a ton of keratin gets in there, but is there something that kind of triggers yeah. the apoptosis? So yes, you're absolutely right. What happens is it reaches a critical point of having so much keratin inside of it that having, once it reaches that critical point of keratin, that's what triggers the apoptosis. So it just keeps making more and more and more and more and more of this protein till it reaches this critical point where it's like, all right, not only do I not need to make any more proteins anymore, but I don't need this nucleus anymore either. And it basically triggers this program death, cell death. So basically from this point on, it's a big, flat, dead, fused together bag of keratin. That's all it is. Now, is what's there interesting- is there, Go ahead. I was gonna say, is there a possibility like of other cells I mean, I guess I'm mutating to copy that. I mean, that would be so, very bad. Okay, so is there a squamous cell carcinoma? Yes. So what can happen is if a cell is mutated, it doesn't undergo that apoptosis the way it normally would. And so it continues to divide and continues to produce new cells. And so, yes, there is a form of cancer where you could have a cell here in the superficial layers that is still dividing and is, not, is still alive, but that's not a normal situation. That would be a cancer. That would be completely abnormal. In normal skin, there should not be any living cells in the superficial layer. Yeah, I was thinking about going the opposite direction of like another cell like triggering apoptosis that's not supposed to. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, no, typically not, no, no. All right. Now, as you guys pointed out, this is thick skin. And because this is thick skin, uh, there is that extra layer that we only find in thick skin known as the stratum lucidum. This is one of the thinnest cell layers comprised merely of two to three layers of dead fused together flattened keratinocytes.
So in uh, thin skin, it just goes straight from the stratum granulosum to the last layer, which is the stratum corneum, as we'll see in a minute. Now again, the layer above this is, as I just finished mentioning, the stratum corneum. What color haven't I used? Uh, let's go orange. And guess what the stratum corneum is made up of? Also, those dead plot used. Yeah, exactly. So the stratum corneum is also made up of layers of dead flat fused keratinocytes. Once you're a dead flat fused keratinocyte, can you really change what your function is? No. So what's the difference between the stratum corneum and the stratum lucidum? No, I mean, I'm really asking you because I really want to know because I don't know what it is. And I don't think anybody else knows either. What's interesting is obviously there's no difference in their function. And there are actually some anatomists who think the stratum lucidum is really just an artifact. However, even if it is the, an artifact, here's the problem with it. Notice when we look at this tissue, it's clearly here. Now, this one may be kind of odd why they call it the stratum lucidum, but let's look at one of the more common stains. Notice with one of the more common stains, this early uh, superficial, or I mean, part, not, sorry, deep layer of dead keratinocytes is very, very clear in color. That's where it gets its name, stratum lucidum. And to be lucid is to be clear. Pretty much any stain you use on the skin, when you look at thick skin, you see a difference in this first few layers and the rest of the dead cells. And so why it's here, what it's doing, none of that seems to make any sense. It is consistent enough of a feature that we are going to consider it a sublayer in the thick skin and be able to easily identify it on the microscope. But you guys are right. There's clearly no difference in the function between the stratum corneum and the stratum lucidum. They're dead, flattened, fused together cells. Now, what is different is the number of cell layers. The average uh, number of layers is 20 to 30, dead layers of stratum corneum. But that would be like getting the average income of California. If I told you the average income in California, and again, I'm just totally making up a number here, was 100,000 a year. Is that a meaningful number? No. No, because there's a ton of people who make less and a ton of people that make more. And for the most part, that's a pretty meaningless number. And it's kind of the same thing true here. So let's think of it more in this way. Where do you think the thickest stratum corneum is located in your body? Make it made up of literally hundreds of cell layers. On your heel? Yeah, the heel of your foot. Right? That's why you can spend 15 minutes with your pumice stone in the shower working on the heel of your foot. And are you going to bleed as a result of that? No, because you have hundreds of dead skin cell layers there. Where do you think the thinnest is? That thinnest is only about two to three cell layers thick. Under your eyes? Close. It's related to your eyes, but not under it, but over it. It's actually your eyelid. Your eyelid is the most sensitive tissue on the body. 
it is where it is the thinnest. So would you want to spend half an hour with a pumice stone rubbing your upper eyelid to get off your eye makeup? No, you'd be well into eyeball in the first couple of minutes of doing that. So don't do that. All right. So yeah, so obviously 20 to 30 layers is the average, but it's pretty meaningless. Obviously thick skin can have hundreds and more layers and thin skin is just that. I mean, thin skin, especially like over the eyes, but arms and other places can have fewer as well. All right. Now, this is that hardened fused protective layer. One of the interesting things about this is while they're fused, while they're attached, we can actually increase the attachment of these cells. If, even though it's 110 degrees outside, right? My wife loves her garden. And so I need to go out there and dig some holes for uh, some more trees that she wants to plant. And if I spend all day using that uh, shovel, and as I'm using that shovel day after day, increasing the pressure on the surface of my hand from that shovel, what's gonna happen, what's gonna eventually happen? A callus. Yeah, form calluses. Those hardened calluses, that enhanced pressure causes the cells to fuse together even stronger, to form even more protection. And that is what we call a callus. Conversely, when I get that new pair of hiking shoes and then I go out for a 10 mile walk and it's constantly rubbing against the surface of the back of my foot, that can actually cause these layers either of the epidermis or the epidermis from the dermis to split and separate. Once that space forms, interstitial fluid will fill that space. And what do we call that condition? Blister. A blister, there you go. So a blister is actually when we damage those layers and interstitial fluid fills them. Notice, especially if it's of the epidermis, a epidermis is avascular, so that's why it fills with interstitial fluid. If, however, you separate the epidermis from the dermis, the dermis has blood vessels in it, and that blood can fill that area, and you can end up with a blood blister. So a blood blister involves the dermis because that's where the blood vessels are. If you just have that clear fluid in it, that's interstitial fluid, and that's because you just separated the layers of the epidermis where we have uh, just that interstitial fluid and no blood vessels. All right, there you go. Questions on this? Notice I've done a drawing. Here's a really pretty drawing. Uh, I don't remember if this one's from your textbook or not, but we can still take a look at it. Uh, notice again, stratum basal, the one layer dividing cells. Notice they put a tactile cell for us and a melanocyte down here. Here we see the stratum spinosum with all their desmosomes holding them together, making them look spiky. Oh, and they've given us a Langerhans cell as well. Dense granules in these flattened cells, major protein synthesis in the lamellar granules of that stratum granulosum, where they undergo apoptosis and die, at which point uh, for thick skin, we get a stratum lucidum. For thin skin, we just go straight from the granulosum to the stratum corneum and then slough off and become dust. Now, this process of dividing a new cell, let's do it this way, and filling it with keratin, that process is what we call keratinization and growth. And it takes about two weeks. Then, depending on the part of the skin we're talking about, on average, it takes another two weeks for those cells to reach the surface of your skin and slough off. So notice on average, about every four weeks, you have a completely new epidermis, which is why, like me, Right, for Mother's Day, I took not just any marker, but a permanent marker and put a big heart and wrote, I love you, mom, on my shoulder. And even though I haven't bathed since Mother's Day, is it still there on the surface of my skin? No, it is sloughed off and gone away because I just put it on the surface. 
If instead I wanted to put something there that would stay more permanently, what do I have to do with that ink? Get it down into the dermis. Yeah, I need to deposit it beneath the epidermis into the dermis, right, with a little needle to put that pigment in there where the dermis is less dynamic and it will stay there for a much longer period of time. Now, four weeks doesn't seem like that long of a period of time. Seems like a pretty quick time to have a completely new epidermis. However, what happens when you're riding your bike and you fall off and you skid up your knee? Does it necessarily take a full month for that skin to replace itself? No. no, because when the tissue is irritated or damaged, our skin produces a hormone-like protein. This is not a hormone, but it's a protein that acts very much like a hormone called epidermal growth factor. And epidermal growth factor basically stimulates the stratum basal, to make more cells and to mature them more quickly. Which is awesome and great when you have been injured. But remember, I said this occurs when the tissue is damaged or irritated. So if instead I want a shiny skin, a shiny, soft, smooth looking skin, so I spend 15 minutes in the shower with my loofah, peeling the superficial dead skin cell layers off of the surface of my body, while I'm busy irritating them to get that nice smooth surface, guess what? I'm stimulating the cells underneath to divide more quickly and more rapidly. And it doesn't just work for skin. As we'll learn, hair grows in the exact same fashion. So when I use a razor to cut my hair and I irritate the surface of my skin, it produces more epidermal growth factor. And what happens to my hair? It grows back. It grows back faster, right? Or if I use a chemical like Nair to dissolve away the hairs, right? And as you're irritating the surface, yeah, you're getting rid of the hairs right now, but you're stimulating faster hair growth. And so like when you were 13 and you started shaving, you had to shave once every, you know, five, six days or something like that, uh, right? Now I shave in the morning, right? I shave this morning before my bike ride and this is what's grown back in just in a couple of hours, right? All right, excellent. Questions on that? All right, one more thing that I want to show you. How are we doing on time before we jump gears? Oops, hold on. Yep, not what I wanted to do. I wanted to see this. Perfect. So, Professor, so working that backwards, uh, if you didn't want to have callous, hardened feet not having pressure on them, would slow down? Yes, if you walked around on your hands for long periods of time, uh, you would then have nice, soft, delicate feet as a result of that. Be hard to get around, not easy to do, but yeah, that, that would decrease the, uh, the, the, the thickness, the callousness of your feet that way, yes. All righty, let's go here. One of the things you'll notice in your modules under the lab handouts are two skin models. These are models that are in the classroom and I guarantee you that will be on the exam. And one of the cool things as you look at these and look at them closely is you'll see they do a pretty good job of showing us the skin. And notice just not the skin, but different parts of the skin. Notice here we have thin skin and here we have thick skin. One of the dead giveaways is over here we have hair and over here we have none. But notice our thick skin has a thicker stratum corneum, whereas our thin skin has a very thin stratum corneum. And notice our thick skin has the stratum lucidum, 
which our thin skin doesn't, right? Notice they don't do a good job of differentiating the stratum uh, granulosum from the stratum spinosum, but we can still see that there is that lucidum there that is on this. So this is a nice model. It has some good things on it. And you will see that there is a second model where again, notice here, they do a little better job of discriminating the layers. Basal, spinosum, granulosum, corneum, thin skin, basal, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, corneum, for thick skin. So here we see these nice sublayers of our epidermis. We can identify them histologically on an illustration, and we can also see them nicely on models as well. But we have one other minor issue. Let's go back to this picture because I think it does a nicer job of showing this. Notice that even in the thick skin, from here to here is the epidermis. From here to here is the epidermis. And in that epidermis, we have either four or five sublayers. Whereas all of this is our dermis. If I can fit five layer sublayers into here, how many possible sublayers could I have in the dermis? Two. Yeah, the good news is it turns out there's just two. So it's not as scary as it looks. Excellent. And so that is what we're going to do next. If there aren't any questions of the epidermis, and I'll come back to that in a second, what we need to do next is to move on to the dermis, where we have two, and it looks like I have to change that as well, two sublayers. All right. Questions on that? Actually, I have to change it in all these. I'm going to go ahead and do that in a minute. We'll do that during the break. All right. Any questions on the epidermis? Everything you ever wanted to know and more about the epidermis. Never knew you wanted to know. Excellent. All right. So with that, then let's go ahead and take our next break. It is 1052. So again, let's come back at 1107 and 1107. We will pick up from there. So we'll go ahead and put it on here. That should work. Eight minutes, seven minutes, perfect. 15 minutes, I will see you back here and I will start the recording at that point. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Let's finish things up. The last thing we need to talk about uh, to get the basic anatomy done and out of the way is to talk, how are we on time? Doing awesome. On uh, the dermis. And as we mentioned, there are two sublayers to the dermis. That makes things a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and uh, draw this. So again, here is our skin. And as we've seen, there are undulations between uh, the epidermis up here and the dermis that is down here. And as we've also mentioned, there are two sublayers. There are also two connective tissues. What are the two connective tissues that we said form the dermis? Areolar, connective tissue. Yeah, and? Deep, irregular. Not deep. I mean, dense. sorry, <clears throat> dense. Excellent. So we have two different uh, types of tissues, two different sublayers. So that shouldn't be surprising 
the superficial layer made up of real art connective tissue is what is known as the papillary sublayer. This makes up about 20% of the epidermis. And not surprisingly, it primarily makes up structures that are known as papillae. So if we cheat and draw a line like this, this upper layer that forms these undulations of the dermis known as a papillae. A papillae is a finger-like extension that sticks up. And why might it be important to have these finger-like extensions? It causes these undulations between the dermis and epidermis, but why might they be important? For transport, nutrients, oxygen, blood to the yeah, epidermis. Wouldn't a flat line do that though too? More surface area? Bingo, absolutely. The advantage of these undulations is we get more surface area. And that more surface area actually serves two very important functions. The first, as you mentioned, is that it increases the surface area for more diffusion of nutrients and resources. Because remember our epidermis is avascular. So everything, all the nutrients, all the oxygen that it's getting, everything that it's getting rid of are from these small capillary loops that are located in the papillary layer of the epidermis, I mean of the dermis. But the other function of having more surface area is it holds the two layers together more tightly, right? I put my hands together and even if I squeeze really tightly, I can still slide them back and forth. But if I interlock my fingers, then it's much more stuck together. So that increased surface area gives us better diffusion and better contact so that these layers don't separate and we don't get those blisters that we've talked about. So notice if we go back to our illustration here, we see those papillae, those finger-like extensions of the papillary layer of that areolar connective tissue. And as I mentioned, it's gonna contain some capillary loops to provide the exchange of materials that our epidermis needs. But there are gonna be some other structures in here as well. Some of them are sensory. Remember, and I'll cheat and I'll draw it here, even though we don't have to know it. Here in the dermis, remember, was a cell called a tactile cell that of course is gonna have a nerve coming out of it, uh, providing us with that fine discrimination. Well, notice here in the papillae, in these finger-like extensions, there is this large bulbous structure known as a tactile corpuscle. Now, these tactile corpuscles are also called Messner's corpuscles because good old Bob Messner was the first one who described it. But notice tactile cell and tactile corpuscle while located in different locations, different layers of the skin even, they have the same name, tactile. So not surprisingly, they serve the same function. Tactile corpuscles also give us that fine discrimination. Now, let's do some more, right? Synthesis of information. Tactile corpuscles are found in the papillae of the skin. And one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, or maybe I did, is that while all of our skin has increased number of papillae, notice, and let's cheat, and in this case, go to the pretty picture from your textbook. Notice when we look at the pretty picture from, your uh, from the model, sorry, the model, while we have papillae in our thin skin, notice in our thick skin, the papillae are much more enhanced, much bigger papillae. And notice it is in these much bigger papillae that we see these tactile corpuscles. So while tactile corpuscles are found throughout our body, where are the two areas where we have the highest concentration of them? Where do we have thick skin? Feet and hands. Yeah, 
Palms of our hand and fingers, soles of our feet and toes. So again, tactile discrimination. Notice our hands have both, lots of both of our specialized type of tactiles, which is how you normally explore the world, right? If there's something unusual you wanna check out, you don't go at it with your elbows. You grab it with your hands and manipulate it with your hands to see what it is. Because we have a large number of both of these types of tactile structures there. Excellent. Now, there are other important sensory structures in this area as well. This illustration doesn't show it, but let's go back to our model. And I think in this case, a closer up view of this one might be a little nicer. There we go. Notice again, this one does a good job of showing us a tactile corpuscle in the papillae of the thick skin. But notice over here, we have a nerve that just comes to a stopping point. There's no special sensory structure attached to it. That is what we call a free nerve ending. And not surprising, free nerve endings can be found in the reticular area like this one here, can be found in the papillary layer, and they can also be found in our epidermis. These sensory structures are what are known as free nerve endings. And free nerve endings give us what we call more general uh, 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 touch sensations. Pain, tickle, itch, and temperature. I know a lot of people, when we first think of it, don't think of temperature as a general touch sensation, but it is. When you put your finger in the water, can you tell that it is precisely 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit? No. no, if you put your hand in the water a lot, you may get close to it, but something that you probably did in elementary school, and if you hadn't, well, then definitely do it now. You can get three bowls of water, one warm, not hot, warm water, one of ice water, and one of room temperature water. You put one hand in the warm water, one hand in the ice water, and you let them sit there for two minutes. Then you take both hands and put them in the room temperature water at the same time. When you do that, does the water feel the same to both hands? No. 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 Right? The water that came from the hot water to the room temperature, it feels what? Colder. Cold. And the cold to the room temperature, it feels warmer. Because our sense of temperature is really a change in temperature. Oops, I didn't write. If you were in a hot tub and I turned it up one degree Fahrenheit, would you be able to tell the difference? No. No. Does that mean that if you sat in that hot tub long enough, and every 15 minutes, I turned it up one degree. If you stayed in there long enough, I could boil the water with you in it. Yep. It's a good guess, but actually, as it turns out, no. The reason for that is we have a second type of temperature receptor that is more of a pain receptor than a temperature receptor. So you would not notice the change until it got to that critical point. At that critical point, whatever that temperature is, now you perceive the temperature as painful. And because it was painful and uncomfortable, you would get out of the water. But guess what? Not everything has that second temperature receptor. Frogs, for instance, don't. Again, I'm not encouraging you to do this, but from a thought experiment standpoint, you can put a frog in an open dish of water. And every 15 minutes, if you turned it up one degree, you could actually boil the water and the frog would never jump up because he would never notice the temperature change. They don't have that second sensory receptor. Their temperature receptors aren't that great. So one degree every 15 minutes, you could actually boil that water and the frog would never jump out. Again, not encouraging anybody to do that. Just explaining how this thing works, that it is a general 
uh, touch sensation. All right, questions on that? All right, I love these pictures from your textbook. Using an electron microscope here, they have shown us some of this real art connective tissue in the papillary layer. So we can see that it's that loose tissue with a lot of room for all the stuff, like the blood vessels and the sensory structures and the small nerves and all the other things that you would find in this papillary layer. Now, the last thing we need to talk about for the papillary layer is, as I mentioned, these papillary layers, these dermal papillae in our, uh, in our sublayer, the papillary layer, are enhanced in thick skin, bringing up something you guys pointed out before. These papillae fuse together in the thick skin to form a structure we call an epidural ridge and it gives that texture, it gives that structure to the fingers and the palms and the soles and the toes that we commonly refer to as our fingerprints, right? You're gonna be examining these in the minutia of details uh, like this bifurcation, a great view of this right here. And we got a bifurcation here and a ridge ending there and all sorts of fun characteristics that you're going to point out and see as you look at these things on yourself and identify from that handout, uh, the, the chart on your lab manual. But we have all of these textures to that. And of course, that's why it's there to give us enhanced grip, to give us enhanced uh, uh, tactile sensation and movement, right? So more grip, more grasp, more texture of that. One of the interesting things about this is they are mostly genetically determined. There's that pesky word most again. Absolutely, they're genetically determined. Uh, characteristics tend to run in families. So if you have a whirl or a loop, you're more likely that your parents had whirls and loops as well. However, do identical twins have identical fingerprints? No. No, no, they do not. So while it is genetically determined, there is some other characteristic that determines these uh, shapes and these or organizations. Now, now, they're typically more similar than a, a, a sibling, a, a non-identical sibling would be, or a parent to a child, but they're not going to be identical. And what's really interesting about these is they actually form in utero. The baby's fingerprints form while they're in mommy's belly. So while those two twins are in the exact same belly with the exact same mom, whether it's temperature differences, slight changes in hormones, whatever it is, there's something about one side versus the other that causes those slight variations in their uh, fingerprints while they're there growing inside of mom's belly. All right. Questions on the papillary layer of the dermis. All right, then let's talk about the deeper layer, the reticular layer. Remember, as we talked about, uh, the reticular layer is what is comprised of the dense irregular connective tissue. And uh, not surprisingly, makes up about 80% of the dermis. And again, the primary characteristic of this is that it has a large number of collagen fibers and some elastic fibers at all sorts of different orientations. That big random bundle of fibers to provide us that with that multi-axial protection from multi-axial stress. But as we look at our illustration, we can see that there is still room for other stuff inside of here. Again, I love this electron microscopy view from your textbook. Notice here with our reticular sublayer, we see all of those massive numbers of collagen fibers at all sorts of different orientations, giving us that strength, that extensibility, and that elasticity to the skin. But notice there are some other things in here as well. The hair follicles, which are the support structures from which our hairs grow our oil producing or sebum producing sebaceous glands associated with the hairs, 
are sweat glands or what are also known as sudoriferous glands and more sensory structures. Two in particular that we want to talk about. The first one, as you can see it nicely on this illustration, is this structure right here. What is known as a lamellated corpuscle. Lamina, like laminated flooring, means layer. What's cool about this structure is it looks like a big onion. This is also called a Pacinian corpuscle because good old Bob Pacinian was the first one who identified it. But what's interesting about this onion shaped structure, and let's go ahead and quickly draw a quick onion here to see how this works. What happens is when this onion structure gets squeezed, those layers stretch. And as those layers stretch, it sends an electrical signal to our brain. So these are what give us your sense of pressure, right? If you grabbed and squeezed a tennis ball, or if someone grabbed and squeezed your arm, or if you thought of the feeling of the chair and your butt pushing down on the chair, that pressure that you can feel in your skin is thanks to these lamellated corpuscles or piscinian, both are acceptable terms. And notice it's got that distinct onion shape. If we look at our models, Notice here it's deep. Notice pressure doesn't need to be near the surface. So we have these deep lamellated corpuscles that have that nice kind of onion appearance to it. And if we go back to the previous picture, it's a little darker in color, uh, but again, you can see that nice onion shape to that lamellated or piscinian corpuscle deep in the skin. And notice this one happens to be in the hypodermis, actually out of the skin. So these are actually deep uh, sensory structures that can be found and recognized on a model or a chart. Again, I'm not going to make you know the uh, tactile corpuscle or the Pisidian corpuscle histologically, uh, but they are things that you need to be able to recognize on a model and a chart, know where they're found, know what they do. All right, and then of course, if we're gonna have the small capillaries, this is also where your large blood vessels and large nerves are located as well. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Now, as I mentioned, and as we saw from the picture, here we see a picture of that reticular sublayer of the dermis with all those collagen fibers at all the different orientations. It is a dense, irregular connective tissue. However, in your entire body, is the arrangement of these collagen fibers truly random? No. No, while there is some variation in their arrangement, there's also some surprising similarities. Here, we actually see this great illustration that shows us the general trends. Again, these are not dense regular connective tissues. They're not all in this orientation, but there is indeed a general trend to the organization of the collagen fibers. And this general trend is going to provide more protection. They're typically aligned along the most common stresses. So notice the elbow, it's much more likely to go up and down because it's stressed in this direction than it would be for a left and right movement of the elbow. This is certainly important from, you know, a, 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 a life standpoint, because again, it provides this extra protection and extra uh, 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 defense against stress. However, why might this be important to understand these cleavage lines or these tension lines from a clinical standpoint? Or making surgical incisions, I believe. Absolutely. If I'm going to have, uh, if I'm going to uh, perform knee surgery on this patient, 
does it matter which way I make my incision on that leg? Whether I go with the lines of cleavage or whether I go against them? Yeah, absolutely. Which one is more likely to scar? Which one is more likely to heal better? Is it better to cut with the lines of cleavage or against the lines of cleavage? Yeah, it's much better to with. With the lines of cleavage, you're much more likely to reduce the scarring, to minimize the change in the skin as a result of that. Heck, if you think about it, the field of plastic surgery is primarily involved with these lines of cleavage of the face. So we know how we can do reconstructions or repairs or even right, plastic surgery improvements with minimized scarring. So yeah, so these things are important both from a functional standpoint, but also from a clinical standpoint as well. All right, questions on that? All right, with that, we are done with the major components, the major organ of the skin. And so from now, we need to talk about the accessory structures. We need to talk about the glands. We need to talk about the hairs. We need to talk about the nails. And then we can sum it all up and start talking about the function of all of these things as well. I think this is, I'm looking at our time. I think we're doing good on time. And I think, let me see here. What do we have left? Yeah, I think we're doing good. Excellent. All right. So I think that is all we're going to cover for today. I think that is today's game plan. I know it's a little bit early, uh, but I also know that the stuff we've been covering is very dense, a lot of vocabulary to it. But it isn't necessarily going to get any better tomorrow, so just be aware of that. So tomorrow, our goal for tomorrow is to talk about the major uh, accessory structures. We're going to talk about hairs. We're going to talk about uh, glands. We're going to talk about um, nails. The good news is the hair and, and the nails are pretty simple. We've talked about the skin. They're almost identical to that. Uh, what's going to be trickier is talking about the glands, because not only do we need to know what the glands are and where they're located, but they're glands. So remember, we're also going to need to know the substance they secrete and also their structural classification and their functional classification. These are things that you absolutely will be responsible for on the models. Those two pictures of the models that I showed you that are in your modules, I guarantee are on your lab exam. But I also guarantee that the glands are something you need to be able to recognize histologically. So again, that will be something that we will work on, on uh, tomorrow. And then for the physiology, really a lot of it we stuff we've already covered. So some of it will be adding a little bit more vocabulary. Some of it will be a little bit more explanation, but a lot of it, like for instance, I've identified for you all of the sensory structures you're pretty much responsible for. And so we will continue from there and talk about those and, and remind ourselves of where we find them and what they do. So there will be a lot of review of that as well. Now, the last thing, even with all of that that we have to cover tomorrow, there should, let me try that again, there should still be some time at the end of class for an exam review. Now, an exam review is not me standing up here telling you what I think is important because that is what I do every day in class. The way I see a review is a review is an opportunity for you to ask questions about the things that you are not clear about. If there's a concept or process or something that is confusing to you, a review is an opportunity for you to ask those questions so we can go over them together and make sure that you understand the information so you can be successful on the exam. So come prepared with questions. If we have a review and nobody asks questions, then I assume that you've all mastered the information and I make the test harder. So make sure you have questions, things that you're not clear about that I can help you to understand so that you can study them well during the weekend and be successful on Monday's exam. 
All right. Questions on any of that? No. Nope. Right. So that is our game plan then for tomorrow. Uh, study well today, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good.